Good morning. I'm Councilman Mark Jonai, Chair of Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to today's oversight hearing on Small Business First Initiative. Thank you all for being here today. It cannot be overstated how vital small businesses are to the economy and the character of our city. According to the Center for an Urban Future, 90% of the small businesses in New York City have less than 20 employees and companies with, with less than 50 employees or fewer account for 97% of citywide business jobs growth between 2000 and 2013. Despite these numbers, Small businesses, which include mom and pop shops, micro businesses, and WMBEs, face many obstacles that hinder their ability to grow and compete with larger enterprises. Simply put, these businesses are too important for us not to do everything in our power to help them thrive or survive. In 2015, the administration launched the Small Business First initiative with the objective of providing small business owners with much needed support as they face various external headwinds, including a rise of online shopping, changing consumer behavior, and the escalating cost of doing business in New York City. Small Business First is an interagency initiative administered through Department of Small Business Services and the Mayor's Office of Operations. Its stated objective is to ensure the city government fosters a regulatory environment that allows small businesses to start operate and expand. This hearing will focus on the steps that SBS has taken to improve the climate for small businesses. We are particularly curious about the programs that the city has, or the progress that the city has made in implementing the 30 recommendations it identified in 2016. We are looking forward to learning more about the Small Business at First initiative and hearing from advocates, entrepreneurs, and our colleagues from the Department of Small Business Services. I'd like to thank the committee staff, Council Sylvester Vivan, Policy Analysis, Michael Kurtz, Finance Analysis, Aliyah Ali, Aliyah Ali, my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, and my Legislative Aide, Darden Janbale, for their work in making this hearing possible. Finally, I'd like to recognize the committee members that are currently with us, and I'm sure others will join us, but with us we have Council Member Ayala. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Do you swear firm to tell the truth and respond honestly to Council Member questions? I do. Good to go? Okay. Good morning, Chair Jonah and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Jackie Mallon, and I'm the first Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Small Business Services, or SBS. <clears throat> at SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I am pleased to testify on Small Business First and our work to reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses. I am joined by Deputy Commissioner Rachel Van Tosh and representatives from other partner agencies to assist in any additional questions that you may have. At SBS, we know that it can be difficult to start and grow a company in New York City. Businesses are facing rising rents, changing local markets, and numerous regulatory requirements. Despite these, New York City's small businesses continue to grow. Over the last 10 years, the number of businesses in New York City has increased by 10%. To support this continued growth, the city is committed to making the regulatory environment easier for small businesses. Regulations are important to ensure health and public safety, but they should be fair and not overly burdensome. The city should also provide assistance to help business owners to understand fair regulations and strengthen compliance. Three years ago, Mayor de Blasio challenged his deputy mayors and regulatory agencies to reduce the regulatory burden on the business community. On behalf of this leadership team, the Mayor's Office of Operations and SBS launched an outreach effort to hear directly from business owners and stakeholders. Over the course of eight months, we heard from hundreds of business owners, advocates, neighborhood and community leaders, and elected officials across all five boroughs. Following this outreach effort, the city launched Small Business First, or SB1, an interagency initiative to make government more effective and efficient in helping businesses start, operate, and expand. Based on stakeholder feedback, the city developed 30 commitments with four key objectives central to SB1. These commitments are regularly monitored by a steering committee and through the mayor's management report. The first broad goal of SB1 is to provide clear information with coordinated services and support. In most cases, business owners want to operate in compliance. However, information and regulations isn't always easy to find or understand. 
To make it easier, we built the state of the art NYC business portal to be a central repository of key business information and a single place for business interactions with the city. On the NYC business portal, a business owner can create an account and link their licenses, permits, inspections, and violations from key city agencies onto one dashboard to stay informed. In addition, they can receive alerts for renewal no notices and new violations or complaints they receive, making it easier for them to stay in compliance. In 2017, there were more than one million visits to the NYC business portal. Some transactions with city agencies require business owners to visit agency staff in person for security and privacy reasons. To make these visits as easy and efficient as possible, SBS partnered with agencies to create the Small Business Support Center in Queens. At this center, business owners can connect with staff from multiple regulatory agencies in a single location, saving them time and money. To date, 21,000 services have been provided to business owners at the Small Business Support Center. Our second goal was to help business owners understand and comply with regulations. For this goal, we created comp compliance advisors, outreach staff cross-trained in the most common regulations enforced by all city agencies. Compliance advisors vis visit business sites and educate business owners before inspections to help them avoid potential violations. Business owners saved nearly $25 million in avoided fines with the help of compliance advisors. We also expanded remote adjudication options so business owners don't need to leave their business during operating hours in order to refute a violation or fine. For more than 700 additional violation categories, business owners can contest a violation via phone, video conference, online, or by mail. Third, we sought to reduce the burden imposed by complex regulations and fines. Using a structured methodology, the Mayor's Office of Operations led a review of the rules of the City of New York and identified priorities for reform. Currently, 80 of those rules are being modified to have a positive impact on businesses. More than 40% of these rule modifications have already been adopted. In partnership with the Department of Buildings, we also work to standardize DOB plan objections to make it easier for business owners to understand and participate in the process. Approximately 160 common objections now utilize simplified standardized language. DOB and FDNY also agreed to a process change that would streamline the submission and review processes for alternative or automatic fire extinguishing systems, fire alarm systems, and fire protection plans, saving money and time for small business owners. And fourth, we aim to ensure equal access for all business owners. We expanded the availability of materials in multiple languages. There are now a total of over 200 translated versions of our business materials. Um, we also regularly host interagency events with multiple regulatory agencies, including FDNY, DOB, DCA, and DOHMH. This allows business owners to have their questions answered directly by city staff. These interagency events have been held directly in communities across all five boroughs, reaching nearly 1,000 business owners. This administration has made additional changes to help small businesses beyond the work of SB1. Since the start of this administration, DC has reduced fines to small businesses by more than 50%. This administration, with support from Council, overs overs also oversaw the implementation of the Cure Law, which allows uh, business owners to correct many first-time violations. DCA has issued more than 8,000 curable charges since July 2014, saving businesses $3.2 million. DCA, with support from SBS, also hosts business education days to educate business owners about DCA's laws and rules while strengthening the relationships between the city and neighborhood business communities. We will continue to work to make the regulatory environment easier for small businesses while protecting public health and safety. We know there's a, a, always more work to be done, and to that end, we look forward to partnering with the Small Business Committee to identify new opportunities for improvement. Thank you, and I'll take your questions now. Thank you. I believe the stated objective of SB1 is to make government more effective and efficient in helping small businesses start, operate, and expand. It has 30 recommendations to greatly improve the city's regulatory environment for small business and save business owners time, money, and hassle as well as increased satisfaction with city services. Due to the scarce resources, business owners are at the le are least capable of navigating this bureaucracy. At the time that SB1 was announced, the administration pointed out there were about 6,000 rules and regulations and over 250 business-related licenses and permits facing business owners. Three years into Small Business First, a program that was specifically designed to combat these issues. I'd like to ask where the administration is on reducing these burdens. As mentioned, there were 6,000 rules and regulations facing businesses owners before SB1. What is the number now? Actually, the, <coughs> the formal review, um, we determined there's actually 50, about 5,300 rules, um, and not all of them impact businesses. And we haven't seen a net uh, change because rules are constantly being 
added and or um, repealed, and, uh, and the intention of SB1 was not necessarily to limit the number of rules, but to make it easier for businesses to be in compliance and to make the processes associated with the rules less burdensome and more efficient. And to that end, I think that we've, we've, we've made some progress. So the question is, how many rules or regulations or license or permits has SB1 removed or combined? So as I, I think I said in my testimony, we've identified about 80 rules that are, would have an impact on businesses that are, are in either been changed or in the process of being changed or, or modified. Of the original 6,000, which 5, we calculated to 5,300, yeah. yep, I believe that's there's a uh, Scott yeah. Stringer uh, red tape that shows over 6,000, but we'll take the number for what it is. Okay. So three years later, correct? $27 million. Yep. And we have modified 80 but regulations. We have identified 80 uh, rules that are would have an impact on business that either have been modified or are going to be modified or in the process or have been eliminated. Can you be a bit more specific on the 80? I that have, you have actually modified or removed. I have a list. Do you want me to go through all 80? Just or yeah, I I can really? Yeah, let's hear that. Okay. Um So, uh number 1 to reduce signage uh, requirements for vendors of electronics and, and or home appliances. This rule has been uh, changed to allow for a cure period on violations to DCA sidewalk cafe signage requirements. Um, to remove criminal penalties for violating moisture content regulations. To eliminate the need to obtain a mobile food li vending license before applying for, waiting for the waiting list for fresh fruits and vegetables and permits. I'm very happy to provide this to you guys. Yeah. And, and Perhaps that'd be better. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> As mentioned, there were 250 licenses and permits facing the average small business owner for SB1. Prior to SB1 formation, what is that number now? I don't know the number. I don't know the specific number. Do you? It's a similar number. 80? Uh, um, or 250, so we haven't removed anything or have anything added as far as licenses or permits? Do I need to scroll down? Do you want me to read them? Okay. Um, <laughs> it's been about the same number. We've repealed and uh, like combined, I think, about half a dozen, and that's impacted about a 1,000 business owners across the city. What is the number of city agencies that a business owner had to interact with prior to SB1, and what is that now? So the number of, of city agencies a business would have to interact with would, be would depend on the type of business and the type of activity, and, and so um, it varies. So, um, and the intention of SB1 wasn't necessarily to reduce the, the, agency and the number of agencies that a business interacted with. It was to make the interactions more efficient and more transparent. So it's about the same. And in some cases, processes have been uh, made more efficient. And, and, and for a narrow slice, they may be interacting with fewer on certain transactions. A key promise made during your 2000, the SB1 report in 2015 was that the city will reduce the time required mm -hmm. for a business to open or work with the city by 50% and reduce the incidence of repeat violations by 10% in mm -hmm. neighborhoods targeted for outreach training and support. On a related note, what was the total amount in business fines and fees by agency collected by the city pre-SB1? Mm -hmm. What is the total amount in fines and fees collected today? Um, I don't know the, the specific answer to your very specific question, um, violations and fines by agency. What I do know is in the aggregate, the, the number of, of fines and violations has gone down post SB1, and the fines associated have also gone down. I'm happy to follow up with specifics by agency <coughs> offline. 
I believe in your opening statement you referred to twenty five million dollars. Mm -hmm. Do you know how we came up with that number? Yes. Um, as I said in my testimony, we have implemented compliance advisors, which is a service that we offer to businesses. Um, person will go out to the business site and, and do a review and identify, this is pre-inspection, um, identify the, the cases in which they would get a violation. And we track that, we inform them, we help them um, fix it. And it's simple math. It's a, the number of cases in which we did that by, uh, multiplied by the average cost of the fine that they would have gotten had we not assisted them. So it's not a tangible number of 25 million. This is a number had an inspection been done and that small business been issued a violation. That's the calculation. So it's not a net number that shows a decrease in fines or violations by dollar amount. Um, the 25 million, like I said, ref it, it's, it's exactly right. The, the calculation is based on what would have happened had we not intervened um, and multiplied by the, the average uh, violation cost. But as I said, what we have also determined is in the aggregate, violations have gone down. Um, but we don't know the dollar yes. amount. I, I don't have the specific dollar amount, well, but we can certainly uh, come back to you on that. Well, then let me ask the question a different way. Sure. Has the number of violations issued to small businesses gone down as versus the dollar amount that's derived from these violations? In, in both cases, in the aggregate, what we can tell is that, that it's, it's gone down since SB1. And we don't have those numbers. I don't have a fight agency specifically. What do you have I the numbers, the overall numbers? I don't have the, the overall numbers, but we can certainly follow up with you um, and, and get them to you. And perhaps when we give the breakdown of by agency that we can add by borough as well so we have an understanding if there's an overburden of any one particular burden be borough being targeted, and then we'll look into yeah. the district. The just to give an opportunity to my colleague who I know, oh, she just stepped out. I know she has another hearing. Um, Of the $27 million budget, $9 million annually, what is the number of employees uh, that work at SBS directly focused on SB1? The, the number is 21, but the majority of those um, uh, people are uh, direct service providers, our compliance advisors and our client managers. There's four people, right, who are dedicated to um, working with the other agencies and project managing the effort over time. We know the national numbers are 20% of all businesses will fail within the first year. 50% will fail by the fifth year. And two-thirds, that's 66%, will never make it to 10 years in business. Mm -hmm. Do we know the numbers for New York City? Um, I think they're, they're similar, but we're, we're we do not have um, New York City specific. Our census that they're similar. I and we use them as a guide, the national ones. Well, I would imagine that if we're going to grab the bull by the tail, by the horns and not the tail, <laughs> that we'd want to know how many businesses <laughs> <Sorry>. are failing. <laughs> you made me like uh, visually picture yeah. that. Sorry. <laughs> um, since it's three years, of actually focusing on the issues that small businesses have to deal with day in and day out, which includes micro business, mom and pop shops, yep. and our WMBEs, which we focus so much on. If we can't keep a track of the businesses that close, how do we know that we're actually helping? Well, um, as I said, SB1 was, was intended to help clarify, um, make more transparent, provide education. And we track a lot of the activities associated with the initiative. And as I said, it, it, we have determined that we've saved, for, with compliance advisors, for example, set $25 million. And each of the initiatives is tracked specifically. And when it's all implemented and there's enough time um, to actually measure, we'll be able to determine specifically you know, what we've done and, and saved in terms of time and, and dollars. In your own report, under accountability, uh, and I <laughs> believe I have this verbatim, we will begin implementing these recommendations immediately, holding ourselves accountable by tracking progress yep. against specific and ambitious goals. Yep. We will ensure that we are saving business owners time, money, and hassle. Yep. 
as well as increasing their satisfaction with city services. $27 million later, we don't have an exact number of, besides the theory of the businesses that you prevented a violation should, and that would have been 100% of these businesses would have been, had some form of inspection yeah. by the various agencies specific to those regulations. We have nothing concrete. Well, that's one example, and it's associated with one of the 30 recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, we're not ready to, to claim you know, total victory in all of the, the goals that we set out yet because there hasn't been enough time um, for many of these changes to be implemented, and some of them are still not implemented. And so what our analysis tells us, though, is that we're on track to meet or even exceed a $50 million savings annually for businesses through a, a combination of all of the things that we implemented through SB1. So. One of the claims in your report uh, that was handed out claims that 28,926 jobs were created with SBS client manager support. Do you have a breakdown or can you be a bit specific as what type of jobs and how? Yeah. I, I also want to I want to clarify because mm. um, it if it if you interpreted that that uh, phrase twenty we didn't create the jobs obviously government doesn't do that um, what we're intending there is is to suggest that we've supported the creation of those jobs and it's a combination of um, food business restaurants food businesses retailers nail salons but probably the uh, majority yeah, restaurants so how'd you foster this growth then. So our client managers um, are available to businesses who are who are opening, um, or not actually, um, and they help them one on one navigate the the processes they will need to go through. And sometimes, if they get stuck in the process, they're able to help clarify and and help them move more expeditiously. That work, I think, um, we have determined that uh, we saved about a month and a half on opening time for businesses that receive that service. Is that right? Two and a half months, sorry, even better. And businesses that partook in the yeah. SB1 mm -hmm. initiative. The client management service, yes, which is one of the initiatives. It just sounds like, you know, a great headline that uh, small business uh, services gets from SB1 without concrete evidence. Uh, day in and day out, small businesses are complaining of over-regulation unfunded mandates, compliance, that they spend more time complying than they do growing their own businesses. And small business initiative sounds wonderful, but we don't have anything to show that's concrete in the form of dollar amounts or that we can gauge had SB1 not been implemented. Mm -hmm. There's no comparison the rates of businesses which are compatible to what they were before SB1, mm -hmm. that was closing within the first year or not making it through year five, have not changed. Um, the dollar amounts being raised through fines and violations, according to your statement, have been lower, but we don't know the dollar amount. I don't know the dollar amount, right. and, and I'm not, I don't have it for you today. We have it, though, and can share it with you in follow-up. And I don't know that I would agree that, that we don't have any concrete evidence that, that um, we've met. What I said was we're not prepared yet to um, be definitive about the specific amount of money that we save businesses because some of the recommendations and the, have not been implemented long enough to tell using a sort of a scientific method. And we'd like to be, as we said we would, you know, very clear and accountable on, on what, what these changes made. Well, our analysis, which is not complete, um, suggests to us that we are on track um, to, to meet the $50 million goal or even exceed it. Do you think you're on track with the uh, promise to reduce by 50% the incidence of repeat by, I'm sorry, to 10%. reduce the time required by business to open or close by 50%? I think we're making strides. It's, uh, that's a, a, a harder um, metric to, to isolate. We're establishing a baseline now. Because when you open a business, as you know, um, depending on the type of business, you will it will it'll be very different for you. You have to interact with the federal government, the state government. You may or may not have to do construction. What we're trying to do is isolate the pieces that the city is is responsible and make sure that those 
um, times are, are, are reduced, and early indications suggest that some, at some of the major agencies, processing, agen processing times have gone down. And we've made some changes to some of the processes to, to uh, consolidate efforts between agencies, and they've gone down. So we feel like we're on track, but too early to tell, for sure. We should always strive to improve. Totally agree. Um, where can we improve SB1? Um, I think we, the number one thing that we heard uh, when we did, I, as I said to my testimony, we, out, we did outreach. We heard from over 600 businesses throughout the five boroughs, and overwhelmingly they said, please make it you know, more and more transparent. Please make it easy to understand. And so we've done a lot, but I think that we have to need to continue to do that you, you know, or sort of forever, because we're a complex city. There are a lot of rules. Public health and safety is, is an important consideration. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that that's an ongoing effort we'll have to make from now until forever, probably. Is there anything that can come to mind that we can start to focus on to, ins to improve and strive to improve the climate in which our small businesses have to operate that fall within the parameters of SB1? Um, so we... Our goal will be to continue to implement what we've already identified, because those are the things that, that um, small businesses said were their priorities. We'll be happy to, to work with you and, and figure out if there are additional um, things that are pain points that we should address most immediately. But I'm sure they're gonna be along the lines of make it more transparent, make it easy to understand, make it easy for me to, to to get through the process. Less of a burden, less yes. regulation, oh, that's remove the 5,300, remove the fines, <laughs> the dollar amount associated with. cannot move the 5,300, but yes, I, I see your point. So. I, I think small businesses would, they view government as not a partner, mm -hmm. but as the enemy that undermines their business model day in and day out someone that is not willing to help them foster their growth or survive, but is actually the impediment to survival. How do we change that through SB1? Um, like I said, we are, number one thing they said was make it more transparent, make it more clear. So we'll show you, make efficient. it more transparent means I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna hurt you more and more not, day in and day out. I, I, I wouldn't agree with you on that. I would say that uh, most business owners that we interact with, and we interact with a lot, are want the city to be safe for the public, want the, the uh, care about public health, care about quality of life, because they are part of the city. What they have difficulty with sometimes is it's hard to understand how to be compliant and how, to, how we all uh, meet our mutual objectives, and so they're looking for help in that regard. Right, so if there's a new policy or regulation enacted, most small businesses find out when they receive a little pink ticket that says you're in violation, please pay. And uh, those fines are no longer nickels and dimes, but they come with many zeros at the end. Mm -hmm. So when you refer to transparency, what is the outreach that we're going to do for small businesses, in particular maybe a specific industry that has a new regulation that they may not even be aware of? Yep. Well, so. That was also part of SB1, and, and, and it is part of transparency, and it is part of education. So we have done, um, we ourselves, SBS, with our partner agencies, have increased outreach. Each of the agencies um, uh, is out in the community more, making themselves available to ask, for, for business owners to ask questions. We have our Chamber on the Go initiative, which we do in partnership with, with you guys. Um, the portal is, is um, up and available to help businesses, you know, get be in touch. So. Yeah, but small businesses work six days on average a week. Yes. Some even seven. If they're lucky. They do you know, two shifts just to keep their doors open. Mm -hmm. They don't have the luxury or the liberty of contacting a government agency to find out, is there anything new this mm -hmm. week? I'm trying to focus on keeping my doors open, my customers happy, selling my products and services just so I can meet my obligation. Mm -hmm. What are we doing as a agency? Well, like I said, we are we are out in the community making sure that people are aware of any changes or, or existing uh, rules or, or anything um, in our services. On the portal, you, when you sign up, you can you can get notifications. So if that's a method that you like, um, 
all of our partner agencies are out in the field doing business education days. So we're walking the streets, you know, with our, our client managers. We're, we're we're out there, but we could always do more and would seek your help to to, to try to figure out ways to, to get it out, out there even more. Well, certainly. I think any regulation that's changed that impacts a certain business, not wait for that. That's a small business owner calling you now. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> I would imagine uh, small business owners are relying on government to inform them of a change, giving them ample notice, giving them time to comply, mm -hmm. giving them the ability to, in most cases, um, save the money to change whatever that regulation or to adapt or adhere to that regulation. Mm -hmm. We don't do any of that now. When there is a change in regulation, there isn't a mailer that goes out to that business owner. There isn't someone knocking on that business owner's door. There isn't someone approaching uh, that mom and pop shop saying, hey, by the way, this is important. In the next X days, there's a change that impacts your business. Here's what you need to do mm -hmm. to comply. Um, you're, 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 you have a, is there a question in there? Or yeah, kind of. Okay. I'm, with, <laughs> I'm opening the door for you now. <laughs> um, I disagree. I'm, I'm sure we could do better because we, you know, it, it's a very large city and, and we always want to do better. But as I said, we, ha we are out there through our Chamber on the Go initiative. Our partner agencies um, are out there holding business education days. They don't have time. There so are there are uh, email blasts. The there are so sometimes um, flyers that are handed out. There, are, you know, this email blasts. Explain that. There's some agencies have have uh, some. You, some. Yeah. So, using the same explanation you just gave me, as yes. a small business owner, I'm a pizzeria guy. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, there's a regulation that's changed. You come to me, and you say hey, you're in violation. They say, yeah, but I'm striving to do better. I didn't know. Is that acceptable or I still get a fine or a violation for not complying? It it probably depends. In some cases, there are, there are cure periods. In many cases, there aren't. True. My, my question, it, we're it government. Depends. We're supposed to be doing better. We're expecting small businesses to do what we're not. We're expecting small businesses to understand the changes in their business models while not providing them the information to do so. It's a gotcha. The more regulations that we have on the books, the more enforcement we have, the more we're going to find small, in the name of public safety, of course. And it sounds more and more like a line item in the revenue budget that we have as a way to raise funds through the hard work the sweat of small businesses. Mm -hmm. Like I said, <laughs> what, uh, violations have gone down since SB1. SB1 was all about making sure that we could improve in terms of transparency, make it easier for businesses to comply. M where we can uh, change the processes so, so that it's easier and more effective, reduce the time, all of those things. We are, we are in agreement that small businesses are very important to the city of New York and are trying to ensure that we do our best to make it better for them. This is what this initiative is all about. And small businesses are trying to comply <laughs> and because of lack of information and resources and time, they're not. But we're not giving them the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. We're penalizing them without giving them a chance. And I and we've spoken off record on this in our meetings. Mm -hmm. And I use an example of signage where the code dates back to 1960 or 61, doesn't allow for more than 12 square foot of print. Store owners have been in existence for 50 years with the same sign, not knowing they're in violation there was a moratorium that was placed that was lifted, I believe, by this administration. 
and the fines begin from 5,000 to 20,000 for an illegal store sign. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that have that been an easy one for SB1 to have taken on? So you know what, maybe this one we can put back the moratorium. Maybe this one we can revise the laws and help small businesses instead of hurt small businesses. Mm -hmm. So two things. Um, the rules are in place to ensure that there's public um, safety and public health and quality of life sometimes. So what's the public safety aspect of a sign? And quality of life sometimes. What is it? So, what, so explain to me the quality of life of a 70-year-old of a of sign, year old so sign uh, law, 70. Um, I'm just going to finish my point, and mm -hmm. then I'll be happy to try to explain um, if I can. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, that, that that's what the rules are, that are are in place to do. I don't have information. I'm not I'm not Department of Buildings. They're not here today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure about their enforcement policies or not. But I do know that you know rules and regulations are in place in order to support public safety. Where our SB one was driven by all of the priorities cited by business owners at the time. This was not one of them, which is why. It's not part of this, um, but we are happy to work with you, um, maybe uh, sit with the OB and, and see if there's something that, that we can do together uh, to, to make it better and resolve the situation. No, there is. We can call for a moratorium on fines and violations today, this afternoon, the second we walk out of this hearing to say, you know what, small business? Maybe they know about it last week, but the chairman brought it to my attention. <laughs> and this is an easy fix for us. In the meantime, till we create the final fix. We know that much has changed in the 60 years. Mm -hmm. And a regulation on size of signage, lettering, not even size, lettering, and the methods by which we advertise our business, which I believe back then didn't even allow for phone numbers to be placed on signs, mm -hmm. would have been an easy fix for SB1. Mm -hmm. Let's go on another one. I think we spoke about this one too. Uh, ADA compliance. Mm -hmm. Landmarks does not allow for ADA compliant ramps to be installed on our landmarks. Therefore, creating a real problem for these small businesses. Landmarks won't issue a permit and allow them to build ramps. They have to put in temporary structures, which is in violation of the federal law, and it's a gotcha. If I don't put in a ramp, I'll be sued, and there are many small businesses which are being targeted by these attorneys on behalf of ADA compliance, and Landmarks refuses to allow these, this compliance, a federal compliance, subjecting them to all types of lawsuits. So it's either a fine for doing work without an approved permit or a lawsuit for noncompliance. Mm -hmm. What would SB1 do? So to my knowledge, Landmarks um, does not hold out an approval on uh, ADA compliance. However, I am also aware, I'm not Landmarks, obviously, um, I'm also aware that they are in the process of, of trying to make the process much more efficient um, and effective for, for small businesses and others. So we can be happy to um, work with you offline with Landmarks and whoever else is appropriate to see if we can get under this issue and come up with resolutions. It's just remarkable, and I see one of my colleagues has just joined this, uh, Councilman Perkins, but. Um, Government does a great job in taking credit for any small business growth. Does a great job in when our electeds are there to take photos for ribbon cutting. Does a great job in giving excuses as to how we're striving to make things better, but always holding the stakeholders, those that are truly gambling and creating the jobs and paying taxes and making New York City a great city, never giving them an opportunity to catch their breath. 
So when we say transparency, that means, okay, I'm not going to blindside you. So I'll let you know that I'm coming after you, but you're still paying in one form or another. Let me give an opportunity to Councilman Perkins, who may have a question. I know that he represents a uh, very important commercial corridor in our great city. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, uh, and, and for acknowledging uh, the uh, not only the significance of this concern, but also how in, in my district in particular, but other districts throughout our city, small businesses are very often the beginning and the end of uh, good business, and um, even in terms of not just business, but also in terms of uh, community protection and uh, community engagement. And so small businesses, if there's no business, if there's no small business. <laughs> so we're, we're pleased that we're having this kind of conversation. And I just got here, so I'm a little bit behind in terms of uh, what's been discussed, but w where is the uh, administration right now in terms of uh, um, pumping up our small businesses, supporting our small businesses? What are the, some of the landmark stuff that y'all intend on doing ASAP? And how is that being communicated to the businesses in our neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, maybe I could give you just a, a quick um, update on SB1 and the progress that we've made, uh, potentially. Um, as you know, it's a, a, a we have 30 commitments that we um, put in place and, and have implemented 25 so far, all around ensuring that <coughs> uh, we are more transparent with businesses uh, to make it easier to comply with uh, rules and regulations. We've made some processes more efficient, and we've gotten the word out um, to ensure that it, all small businesses, as many small businesses as possible, are aware of how to interact with the with their business. This is done through, um, like I said, 30 different initiatives. I hope. Can you, uh, I don't have the privilege of those initiatives of, at, at hand, so whatever you had towards that end, I'd appreciate if you make sure I'm Absolutely, be happy to do that. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. I know it's a hard one. It's a Monday. <laughs> uh, we're not making it that easy, but uh, it's not easy for our small businesses uh, and the competition that they have uh, and the hurdles that they have to overcome day in and day out. And we're trying to figure out how to make their lives a little bit better. See, small business, and I know that you have some experience here, uh, it was once perceived every employee aspired to become an employer of small business. And they were able to make a great living, provide for their family, and then ultimately they were able to cash in on the sale of their businesses. That model has changed over the decades. Businesses are just trying to survive, and at best, it's a paycheck. There is no cash out at the end when they're ready to retire. There is no resale of their business for the most part. It's a liquidation and it's at a loss. It's a terrible environment for small businesses, and using the statistics that we know nationally, which you feel are at par with New York City, we should do more than strive. It's how do we make a real change? How do we sit down and work with these small businesses so their rate of survival could be increased? So their rate of return and true appreciation for what they offer and how vibrant they make the communities that we live in and our commercial corridors improve the quality of life where we no longer, we can walk to buy products and services. How do we change the impression that government is here to hurt and not be that partner? Mm -hmm. How does SB1 really deliver on its promises? Mm -hmm. And what will it take mm -hmm. so we can show that New York City does care and not only cares, but is a partner, a true partner, in these small businesses? Mm -hmm. um, some of the, the things I've already covered, but um, as I said, SB1, very much about 
improving transparency, making processes more efficient, less burdensome, education. Um, and it also, I didn't, I guess, explicitly say this, but there were also some initiatives aimed at um, improving customer service. And, and those things have also um, been done. M most of the, all of the agencies who have partnered with us on this have really worked hard to improve where they can uh, for small businesses and we'll continue to do that. It's very important that we share your um, passion, your passion, mm. your love, your your support for small business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's our thing. So we, we would love to work um, with you and the committee to figure out, you know, how else we can do better. Let's start with removing 10% of the regulations. So from 5,300, let's come up with removing a small portion and consolidating some of these outdated laws and regulations that are on the books, these gotcha laws. Let's start with reducing the number of fines that we issue. How about we give them a chance and offer time for corrective measures before we fine? That would be education. Mm -hmm. See, when you say education to me as a small business owner, say I'm going to help educate you, I say that's great. Tell me where I'm not complying. But tell, tell me by finding me. I understand. Give me a warning and give me a, a time frame to comply. That would be educating. Mm -hmm. The latter is punishing, not education. So can we come, can we commit to removing regulations that are outdated, can we commit to removing the number of fines and the dollar amounts that are derived from these violations by educating small businesses on the compliance regulations that they have to adhere to? That would be the right message for SB1. Uh, I, we can absolutely commit to working with you to try to improve um, all of these things for small businesses. The specific remedies we're going to have to, you know, sort of walk through and figure out um, which ones are the priority of the small businesses and, and, and how to improve. But absolutely, we are. Well, I've given you 5,300, a choice <laughs> of any one of your 5,300 to choose from, a choice of your 250 licenses and permits that are required to choose from, and including the two that I just brought to your attention, the landmarks issue, the com conflicts with the federal ADA compliance and the store signage, which is a real hurt on small businesses. And we know as government that there is a lack of compliance and it's not because of it's unwilling to. If we walk outside of this building today, we will see stores that are not in compliance. Mm -hmm that I have no idea based on what they see in their neighborhoods, what they see from their competitors, what they see from their next door neighbors. They're no, their sign is no different. Yet we're allowing them to be targeted and have done nothing to prevent this abuse. Mm -hmm. As I said, happy to, to follow up with you and work together to see what we can do there. What This was not, as I said, part of the set of priorities that small businesses brought to us that informed SB1, but absolutely want to continue to improve. Very, co We are very committed and would love to work with you and the committee on, on further improvement, for sure. Well, then I hope by the next hearing, uh, and eventually uh, we'll be discussing extending the uh, budget for SB1, but there'll have to be real tangible results, and I, I really hope that we can come to a sensible approach. We know what the issues are. We know what the hurdles are for these small businesses. We know what they're facing, and yet we're not doing anything to alleviate this pain. Can you identify any specific license that you are currently working on to eliminate or consolidate. The, can you sorry? Can, can you identify licenses? license and permits? Two hundred and fifty licenses and permits. Yeah, we can send them with yeah. the eighty rules as well. 
Can you identify any regulation of the 5300 aside from the 80 that you are currently looking at to eliminate or consolidate? Um, as I said in testimony, there are processes that we are working on consolidating between fire and, and uh, buildings. We've identified um, several areas for modification, and that's in progress. Fire, can, yeah, you, can you be uh, a bit more specific? Yeah, I'm going to probably get these mixed up, but it's uh, uh, re relating to the fire alarm, fire suppression systems, and approvals for those for those things, and fire protection plans. And fire protection plans. All are relevant, obviously, to uh, many, many businesses and, and physical locations in New York. I, um, I so you are optimistic that there's some there's some good news coming for the small businesses, as per some of the efforts that you all are making in the recognition of their needs. Did, can you outline just because I got here a little late, so maybe you are regretting? Sure. Can you repeat any any new initiatives that small businesses are cheering about that you would like to brag about? <laughs> <laughs> I am, in general, optimistic, for the record. Um, and, but, but yes, we, I, we are uh, optimistic about the progress so far on, on SB1. And as I said, um, we've already uh, implemented 25 um, of the recommendations and commitments that we made through SB1. And there's a, a variety of them, um, all aiming at improving transparency, um, uh, increasing education, modifying the processing times, and, and so forth. So. And I don't generally like to brag, actually. But I do appreciate it. Be modest, <laughs> if, if you must. I just think it's always helpful uh, in, in these type of hearings where there's a constituency out there that's sort of uh, yes. feeling, uh, to some extent, neglected, that you can lay out as often as possible some of the efforts that are being made that are promising and uh, effectively making sure. a difference for people. Sure. I mean, maybe you, uh, you may have uh, some ways that you can help us get the, the word out as well, because obviously not every um, business owner is aware of all of the services that we have implemented through SP1. But like for uh, well, anything that we can do to promote yeah. good news that you're offering, please don't hesitate. That would be great. We'd love to work together on that. We try um, as much as we can to get the word out and in increase our outreach, but can um, never do too much. So I would appreciate the opportunity to work with you on that. Are you uh, familiar with the um, pilot program by this administration on congestion in New York City, uh, the Clear Curbs uh, pilot program? I'm, yeah. I mean, I don't have too much familiarity beyond that. It's a pilot intended to try to um, uh, deal with congestion. So clearly, you know, congestion is a real problem. Absolutely. Um, the this administration uh, began a pilot in the boroughs of Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens. Mm -hmm. In essence, it's not allowing stopping, parking, or standing of any vehicles from 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. and then from 4 p.m. till 7 p.m. on these commercial corridors. When we look at the impact that this will have on those small businesses which are accustomed to having customers pull up to their establishments, buy their products, services, or pick up their products or services, or drop off their products so they be can, can be serviced. We have not heard from those stakeholders. They have not been given ample notice, and their business model has been completely undermined. Is this something that SB1 should be looking into and perhaps offering recommendations to the administration after understanding the impact on these small businesses? We have one particular small business owner that within the first week of this implementation, his business dropped by 30 percent. Um, so 
as you said, it's a it's a pilot, and it is its objective is to try to, to deal with congestion, find ways to better deal with congestion. Um, my understanding, and I'm not an, obviously I'm not DOT, and I'm an expert on, on their work. Um, they did a lot of outreach um, in advance and continue to do, and, and are available to. So if you have a specific set of cases, I, I know that they would love to, to um, get the, co the contact information about the business or the businesses. Oops, sorry. Um, so that they can follow up. And, you know, we are happy to follow up as well. To, to, and I'll sit down in the room and figure out how we can, um, you know, resolve some of the issues that you're hearing about. For sure. We've already brought this issue to the DOT and okay. a small business owner says it's impossible for me to survive losing 30% of my business for this six month pilot. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if he, if that small business owner, which is a juice bar, which you would imagine in the morning as people head into work, where they can no longer pull up before reaching a destination. Mm -hmm. Completely undermines this individual's business model. So how do we go back to him and he's contacted me and he's begging and pleading to find a way that we can keep his business afloat because this, not not his business model because of challenges in consumer behavior, not because of competition, not because his business has not been doing well, but it's attributed to this one program, an unforeseen, government-induced business model that has been undermined. How do I sit down with him as the small business chair and give him his options? Say, well, here's what we can do. I do not have the answer for you on that today, but as I said, if we, we can get the specific specifics on the businesses that you've been in contact with, DOT, I know would be more than happy and William wants to um, meet with businesses, and we will also be happy to participate in a conversation so we can figure out how to avoid unintended consequences. We've tried that approach already, and it's not going anywhere. Uh, the program is going to continue, the pilot, for six months. This business owner, according to him, will close his doors and will have no one to blame but government mm -hmm. for his failure. That his investments, that his time and his energy, although when he opened up, they were there to cut the ribbon and celebrate were the same groups that allowed the demise of his business. That is true injustice. I know that one of the, in saving time, the out borough businesses are saving time by visiting the Queen's Small Business Support Center, mm -hmm. where I believe three, agency, three agencies are housed. Mm -hmm. Uh, decreasing licensing centers wait time by 38%. How come we haven't expanded this to the other boroughs? We may. It's um, again. We're we're trying to allow sufficient time to measure the impact of all the um, initiatives before we figure out what to do next and whether to expand. If we know this is reducing up to thirty eight percent of wait time, mm -hmm. this would be something that I would be very supportive of. I think we'd all be supportive of. Why aren't Why aren't we asking for additional funding for this expansion now? As I said, I. We may. Too early to, to definitively tell. Those are early results. One of the issues covered in your uh, report, mm -hmm. where it says over 21,000 services were provided, we developed 29 guides mm -hmm. to agency processes written in plain language in partnership with regulatory agencies. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, I'll do my best. Um, so in order to, to ensure that, that people could better um, understand the rules and regulations, the, the plain guide, plain English language guides are intended to use simplified language to clearly explain the, the rules. Um, in some cases, and actually all of them have been translated into various languages as well, so that people who 
whose uh, first English uh, language is not English can also access them. Maybe like a, a short, shortened, fine language description of the, the rules. So the 29 processes. guides in different languages, or are they 29 guides that have been rewritten? There are 29 guides, each of which have been translated into six languages in addition to English. So doesn't that strike you as like, should that raise a red flag to begin with, that there were 29 guides that were developed in plain language? And there's many different types of businesses and processes across the city. So uh, it makes sense to me that there are a number of different guides that you need depending on the type of company you are. I, I'd hope we strive to reduce those number of guides to making a universal language for small businesses instead of 29 different guides and maybe more than one guide impacts the same industry. It's the overburden. Is, is, I think it's a, one of the issues that came up in your report is there are 705 additional violation categories now available for remote hearings. Is that, what's, the, what's the question? 25 percent of respondents have chosen this option when it is available. 705 additional violation categories now available for remote hearings. You're is this oath? Mm -hmm. How many violation categories are there? Is it all 5,300? I, I do not know. I'm sorry. I doubt it's all 5,300 because not all the 5,300 um, uh, impact businesses, as we said earlier. I see that we're joined by uh, Councilwoman Rivera. Um, do you have any questions, Councilwoman? Okay. Actually, Ch Chairman, I do have a question if that's okay. I wanted to ask about, um, I guess, in the beginning of your testimony, and my apologies for, for being late, um, there are multiple hearings going on right now. So no worries. Thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned over the course of eight months, you heard from hundreds of business owners, advocates across all five boroughs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask, um, I guess, on the methodology of, of acquiring that data and having those conversations. Did you pound the pavement? Did you go into these businesses? Was it a survey? And I'm sorry if I missed those details. No, it's fine. It's, uh, it's a combination of all those things. We heard listening se we, we held listening sessions. Um, we did uh, electronic surveys. We did paper surveys, right? Mm -hmm. Events in communities, round tables, one-on-one -on -one conversations. And all of that data is available on the website in terms of what you collected? I don't, I don't know if the I'm not sure if the individual responses are, are um, Available, but we have them. In Just in terms of statistics, because I, I think this survey is so important to find out why people open their businesses, what are their biggest challenges, what do they hope to achieve in five years, and I'm not sure of the questions that you asked them, but I feel like that's, that those kinds of questions might get to the root of why businesses fail or why people choose the locations and the type of businesses that that they choose. So um, if it's okay, if we could be in touch about what some of the questions were for, for the survey and, and how that dialogue happened between you and the business owners, I'd be really interested. That, that, is, um, that sounds great, and, and we could also think about things we could do moving forward to yes, collect those kind of things, thank absolutely. You. You know, I wanna thank you, Commissioner, and um, I truly believe that we're striving to do the right thing, and I hope that um, we'll do more than strive. And I know that these are difficult challenges and we raise the bar uh, to uh, what I hope we'll be able to achieve at the end of SB1's mission. Um, but truly understanding what these small businesses have gone through in the last several years, and I begin with some much needed um, mandates that were placed on them from forced health care coverages to two minimum wage increases. Some great programs such as the paid family leave, 
such as sick leave programs, which were much needed and benefited society. But these burdens were put on these small businesses on top of the 5,300 regulations, on top of the other hurt competition that they have and the, work, the internet, which has changed most business models, the box store competition, the unfair advantage of the mega stores. We're not doing enough and we should uh, really focus on well, we understand how important they are to the city. We understand how important they are to the job creation and making sure that New York City remains the great city to live and work. But we're doing very little to help them succeed. And I, uh, unless my colleagues have any other questions, um, I just want to thank you for your time, unless you have a closing statement as well. No. You guys have another comment? So also in your testimony, you said over the last 10 years, the number of businesses in New York City has increased by 10%. Mm -hmm. Are those businesses, small businesses, um, specifically, are they micro businesses? The, the majority are, are micro businesses. And again, we can we can follow up with you with the, the I'd love a yeah. breakdown, because yep. I know that, you know, especially in my district, there are a lot of tech companies that are coming in, and I'm just curious yep. how, how you define. Yeah, I would really look forward to, to sitting down and, okay. and covering lots of these things for you. Okay. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to working together.